Thank you all, and, and welcome, and thank you for joining the, meet, the webinar on gene therapy this afternoon. Um, the conference that we're doing today will be recorded and will be archived so that you can access it should you have questions or would like a little review shortly after the uh, webinar fi finishes, and it will be there for months um, after. Today we have Dr. Timothy Kripe with us. For our world, um, you might remember that his wife, Linda Kripe, is a pediatric cardiologist and very involved in, in the world of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Tim is an oncologist hematologist from Nationwide Children's Hospital. He's a principal investigator for National, Nationwide Children's Hospital Research Institute and a former chair of the uh, tra Tissue and Gene Therapy Advisory Committee for the FDA. We're really pleased to have Tim with us today to talk about gene therapy, a closer look, to answer questions that are challenges for us to think about and to understand as we move into this new world of gene therapy. With that, I'm going to introduce Tim and ask him to begin. Thank you, Pat. It's a pleasure and honor to be here and to share some of these concepts with the audience. Uh, I know you had asked several questions about gene therapy, and uh, hopefully uh, we can address some of those as we go along. And I'm hoping that the listeners uh, are both excited uh, by what we're talking about as well as uh, being able to put it into some perspective about some of the future challenges. So why don't we start off with some of the excitement. Uh, the promise of gene therapy is really very simple at its core, and that is to correct a defect in a cell. So I've illustrated here that one could, has a the diseased cell that is missing a functioning protein. It might have part of the protein, but it's not a normal functioning protein, and usually that's caused because there's some mutation or deletion in the DNA that I've also illustrated in this slide with a broken uh, white bar representing the DNA. And through gene therapy, we can correct that defect in the DNA, get a complete white bar, as you can see, and then, as I've illustrated with the hatch markings, uh, restore the normal functioning protein in the cell and therefore restore its normal function. And thus gene therapy can take a diseased cell and turn it into a healthy cell. And if one can do this throughout the body, then there is the promise of uh, really a definitive cure for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and that's, that's the goal here. This is really taking uh, a direct aim at the heart of the problem, uh, and that is the uh, mutations in dystrophin. So let's talk a bit about what gene therapy is in general. Well, it's really the use of any nucleic acid to modify a cell, and that could be either a permanent modification, as I just described, or more of a temporary modification in some cases. And usually the nucleic acid then is either DNA, which is the most common, but RNA can also be used, and people can synthesize these on machines nowadays and even create hybrids uh, of DNA and RNA that might have features of both that are advantageous. So as I mentioned in its simplest form, it's replacing a defective gene, and in fact, there's a nice illustration of that, a proof of principle that it can be done in people safely, and that was the FDA approval last year of Luxterna for congenital retinal dystrophy, which is a defect in some of the retinal cells of the eye, congenital defect at birth, and they used an adeno-associated virus, and we'll talk more about AAVs, uh, that expresses that normal retinal pigmented epithelial gene, or PE65, and they it directly inject it underneath the retina, and the cells take it up and get corrected, and people can now see things that they couldn't before. So that's pretty remarkable. And just as of note, because we're going to be talking about doses, there's a very small space they're putting it into, and, and they use a dose of 1.5 times 10 to the 11th. So that's illustrated there is 1.5 E to the 11, E11. So uh, the doses that we're going to need to correct other cells throughout the body, such as with DMD, are going to be much higher than what's able to be used in that small space. Other uses of gene therapy are not necessarily to replace a defective gene, but to change the behavior of the cell. So by putting in DNA or RNA, you can convince the cell to express proteins that it otherwise wasn't expressing and therefore change its behavior. And another example of that occurred uh, shortly, uh, a short time ago in 2006 with the FDA approval of Kim Raya for relapsed leukemia. I was 
uh, fortunate enough to be on the FDA Advisory Committee that approved that. It's very exciting. And in this case, the use of a lentivirus instead of AAV, and a lentivirus was derived from HIV, but it's not a pathogen. It's not uh, going to cause disease. It's just used to get genes into cells. And in that case, they modify the T cells of the patient, but they do that ex vivo, meaning they do that outside the body. So they collect T cells, pull them outside of the body, modify them with the virus, and then put them back in the body. So there's totally different challenges in that kind of gene therapy where they're moving some, doing uh, manipulation in the research laboratory or in the clinical uh, laboratory uh, as opposed to directly in the body. But what we're more interested in for this purpose today is the correction of cells that are inside the body uh, so that we can correct the muscle defect in Duchenne. So what are the most efficient ways to get those nucleic acids into cells? Well, viruses have been doing that for millennia. It's what they've evolved to do best. That's how they work. They get nucleic acid, either their RNA or their DNA genome, into a cell to make more viruses and to alter the cell and, and spread to other cells. So they're the best at doing it, and so we humans have been able to adopt these viruses in order to do so. So a lot of folks have tried different kinds of viruses, from retroviruses, uh, as I mentioned, the lentivirus that was used in the CAR-T cell. Adenovirus is a common cold virus that's been used very often in these kinds of studies. Parvoviruses, which are very small particles, uh, such as adeno-associated virus, which we'll talk more about, uh, is being used in many of the Duchenne trials now. Uh, there are lots of other ways people have used to get genes into cells from encapsulating them with liposomes or binding them to proteins or glycoproteins or just using them straight. It's called naked DNA. And there was even a gene gun invented once, <clears throat> which may not fly in this era of gun legislation, but uh, they actually had gold beads that were coated with DNA on them and could shoot them into the tissues and the cells would take them up. So uh, scientists have been very inventive in ways of uh, approaching getting genes into cells. So the, all this entire field is overseen from a regulatory standpoint by the National Institutes of Health in addition to the FDA. And a number of years ago, 1974, with the advent of being able to splice genes, uh, the recombinant DNA advisory committee was formed, which is part of the NIH Office of Biotechnology Activities, and it reviews the legal, ethical, and social issues of different gene therapy trials and provides a forum for open and public deliberation. I've actually had to present that to them a couple of times, proposals for uh, clinical trials, and uh, they had the mandate to evaluate all proposed human gene transfer trials in the United States, and then they issue recommendations to the NIH director, and those are basically uh, advice to the FDA, and the FDA members are often present and consider those recommendations. Now, the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy has suggested that after a number of decades, uh, this committee may be a bit superfluous in the sense that many of the things that have coming through there now have been seen before and have shown to be safe, and at some point, um, this, this extra oversight committee that's in addition to the FDA may not be necessary. But let's really launch into some of the science, some of the, the uh, mechanisms about how gene therapy works. And in order to do so, we really need to have a common understanding of the terms used in gene therapy. And I'm going to show you a slide next that does have all the definitions, so you can look at it later if you need to. But just to walk through the, those first, because the slide gets a bit complicated, uh, you can look at these lists and, and ask yourself if you understand what they mean. And if you do, great. Uh, for those of you that don't or want a little refresher, I'm going to just run through them pretty quickly. So a gene is obviously what's in the DNA and encodes a protein. In some cases, actually, a gene can encode just RNA that can affect the cell, but for the most part, it's a protein. And when we use the term transgene, we mean taking a gene from outside the cell and putting it into the cell, so transferring it into the cell. So usually a transgene is something that wasn't in the cell normally, and we've directly put it into the cell. 
Now, a promoter is an important concept in this field because a promoter is basically the switch that turns on and off a gene. It's expression. And the promoter is also hooked directly oftentimes to what's called an enhancer, which is other DNA sequences that can help that promoter to, to turn it up. Uh, that enhancer could be far away from a gene or nearby a gene, but a promoter is always linked to the gene. Now, the gene itself may have introns and exons, as many of you know from knowing a lot about the, the, the dystrophin gene. Uh, but when we put a gene from the outside to the inside, you usually don't need those introns. So the, the trans gene is often much smaller than the actual gene. So gene transfer is just the whole process of getting a gene into a cell. But when we do that with one of those non-viral methods, it's typically called gene transfection. And when we use a virus to put it in, it's usually called gene transduction. So it's a subtle difference, but you may hear those different terms. The vec a vector is a virus that we use to um, carry that gene in. The vector usually has some of its own viral genes in it that are required, uh, or at least some of the own, their own DNA sequence that's required uh, in order to make that virus or that vector. So vector is just a generic word for any virus uh, that uh, is used to shuttle a gene from outside a cell into a cell. Genome, most people know that, that word. It's really the whole collection of genes within an organism. So if it's a whole cell, a human cell, the entire genome is all the 20 plus thousand genes in a human. But uh, a vector genome or a viral genome is just the genes that are carried along in the virus. And vector genomes is, is abbreviated VG. That's a common term you'll see. And that's really basically a measurement of how many genomes there are, which is a reflection of how many viruses there are. So when we produce viruses in a culture in the laboratory, uh, we can measure how many we've made by PCR or other techniques to, to count the number of vector genomes. Now, in that process, there's often uh, empty vectors or empty shells of a virus that don't have the genome. So there may be more actual virus particles than there are virus genomes. The dose that people use uh, for gene therapy is is typically in vector genomes, either a straightforward vector genome count as in the Luxterna eye example I gave you where they're injecting a specific amount into the eye. But when these viruses are given systemically or, or into a an isolated limb, for example, or, or into the vein, they're typically dosed based on the size of the individual. And so you'll see the dose listed often as a vector genomes per kilogram so that a small person will get a, a proportionately smaller dose than a large person. And that shell of the virus that's carrying that genome is really made up of virus capsid proteins that assemble into a shell. It's really a fascinating process how they're able to assemble into a spherical shell usually. Uh, and those capsids can be seen as foreign to the immune system, meaning that they're an antigen or they create antigens that are recognized by the immune system. So you can have the virus capsids, uh, which are also usually foreign and, and considered to be antigens. And finally, virus genomes, once they enter the nucleus of a cell, can exist in one of two states or sometimes both simultaneously, and that is integrated into the genome or uh, apart from the cell genome as an episome. And just to show you um, an, uh, an illustration of that on the next slide, uh, this slide I now put in all of the definitions briefly so that you can refer to them later if you have uh, can't quite uh, pin them down in your head. So that's just there for reference. But this slide illustrates those two, the cell that I showed you before that might be missing a piece of DNA. And if the virus comes in and brings that transgene in and it integrates into the cellular DNA, you can see that red insert into the white cellular DNA. And different viruses, as part of their normal life cycle, may exist as an integrated piece of DNA where they're inserted into the cellular genome or as episomes. So an example of the integrated type is the lentivirus, so those T cells that are modified for leukemia treatment I mentioned, um, 
those are typically the gene is integrated into the cellular DNA, and that then becomes a permanent part of that cell. And, in fact, the adeno-associated virus, we're going to talk more about the wild-type version of that, also integrates. In that particular case, it integrates in a specific locus of the cell on chromosome 19, whereas most of other viruses, like lentivirus, they uh, tend to insert either randomly into the genome or, or in areas of the, the that are actively being expressed, um, uh, areas where the gene are turned on. And if you look in the bottom right of this slide, you can see an example of episomal DNA. That is, the virus may bring its genome in as a circle of DNA, and those circles may not integrate into the genome and just remain in the nucleus but apart from the cellular DNA. And they can exist as circles or they can, what we call, tend catamerize where they form interlocking circles like an Olympic symbol, or they can even uh, concatamerize where they become linear back-to-back uh, -back, uh, chains of multiple copies of the genome. When virus genomes like this become episomal, then if the cell divides, those genomes can also divide, but they may get lost. So they're not going to track necessarily with the cellular genome that gets split equally between two cells. These may track randomly, and so as cells divide, it's not really a, necessarily a permanent part of the cell, and so those genomes can get lost, and that may be one of the potential downsides for gene therapy using viruses that are episomal, like recombinant adeno-associated virus. Um, now, in the case of a muscle cell, muscle cells don't divide too much, so the risk of losing those episomes is pretty low. And so we think there will be long-term gene expression, even if the viruses are episomal. So uh, why do I list adeno-associated viruses integrating in the one hand, but recombinant adeno-associated virus uh, not integrating? Hopefully, you'll come to understand that in a few minutes. But first, I just wanted to show you a relative size of uh, adenovirus and adeno-associated virus. And um, uh, I know that some people are typing in some comments and questions, and, and Pat and her team will interrupt me if they feel it's appropriate. Otherwise, we will try to get to those at the end of the webinar. But this is an electron micrograph of uh, the adeno-associated virus and an, uh, adenoviruses in general. So the small circle that you can see pointed at the arrow that I'm now circling with the yellow pen uh, is the adeno-associated virus. So you can see how relatively small it is compared with the other uh, spherical-shaped images here, and those are all adenoviruses, the common cold virus. So you can see Adenoviruses are quite small themselves. They're less than 100 nanometers, as you can see from the slide. But adeno-associated viruses are even smaller. So how small is that relative to a muscle fiber? So I've put a picture of a muscle fiber on this slide, uh, a muscle, two, two muscle cells that are long fibers. Uh, you can see the nuclei. There's multiple nuclei in, in muscle fibers or muscle cells. Those are pointed out by the arrows with the, the purple dots. So uh, we need to get the virus genome into those little purple dots within a muscle cell in order to make activate the genes that we're putting in the transgene and make new protein. So a muscle fiber cell is roughly 70 microns wide, as I've illustrated, 70 micrometers. And there is an AAV virus on this slide, but it may be hard to picture because they're so small. And that's right there. You can see it as a dot. So the typical adeno-associated virus is 20 nanometers, which is less than a thousandth the width of a muscle cell. So you can see that uh, if we just had one of those going into a muscle fiber, it needs to get into all those different nuclei, and that's kind of an uphill battle. And so we need to give pretty decent doses. I've kind of illustrated here with a lot of the dots, a lot of the adeno-associated viruses, in order to get enough of them into a cell to get into the different nuclei to start making the new protein, which then can uh, go throughout the muscle fiber in order to correct the defect. So I did a little calculations here, uh, just sort of back of the napkin kind of thing. The, the doses that have been shown to be effective in animals and that are being tested in people for adeno-associated virus gene therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy are on the order of 1 times 10 to the 14th uh, vector 
vector genomes, VG, per kilogram. So if you take an average person uh, of 50 kilograms, that would be 5 times 10 to the 15 vector genomes. So I've illustrated that that's a lot there. So let's see, 1,000 million, billion, trillion. Um, so that's uh, 5 zillion, I think. <laughs> 5,000 trillion. So if you assume that there's about 20 trillion muscle cells in the human body, which is what some people have estimated, that's about 250 vector genomes per muscle cell. So this is why we have to give fairly high doses when we're giving these viruses into the bloodstream. They are going to go throughout the body, and uh, we need to get them into as many muscle cells as possible. Now, one of the big unknowns is where exactly are these viruses going to go when they go into the bloodstream? Are you going to get caught up in the liver or spleen, which are ostensibly filters of the bloodstream, of the blood system? Are they going to be able to go to all the muscles? Are they going to go to fat cells? Are they going to go to where we don't necessarily need them to go? And probably that's going to happen. And another big question is if there's fibrosis of the muscle because of the effects of muscular dystrophy, is that fibrosis going to cause a barrier inhibiting the viruses? from getting to the the muscle cells that are still there and um, and working in it that could be corrected. And this is probably one reason that gene therapy trials are starting off with relatively young patients who uh, don't have a lot of fibrosis yet. And I think one of the big questions is, is there a, an age or a disease stage that this therapy is going to work best at? So looking at the steps, how does the virus get the transgene from the outside or from its inside, but the outside of the cell, into the nucleus of the cell. There's a couple of key steps that are illustrated on this slide. And uh, one of them, first, is really that the virus here needs to bind to the cell surface. And that's shown over here in the inset, where the virus is binding a receptor, meaning it's just a protein or some sort of uh, molecule, it doesn't have to be a protein, on the surface of the cell. And I can think about that as the uh, lock and key. So uh, this is sort of the front door of the cell. And in order to get in the front door, the virus has to have the right key. So the molecular interactions between these have to match. So the the cell has to express the right kinds of receptors to accept this virus uh, so that it can get in the door. And once in the door, the virus has developed ways through the traffic through the cytoplasm and into the nucleus and then unload its package, its, its DNA. And inside the nucleus is where that DNA is going to start doing its thing. And the promoter that we've talked a little bit about and we'll talk some more about is really what determines how much of that gene is expressed. So if you think about it as a speaker volume, and that might be different. It, it turns it on or, or off or on louder in different cells depending on that cell type and how that cell type is geared up to uh, activate specific genes within it. So the lock and key mechanism, the front door, is really what determines the tissue tropism, meaning what determines uh, which cells are going to take that virus in. And so I've illustrated here on a table uh, from a company that is in this field uh, that had no virus, adeno-associated virus stereotypes, which are the keys, um, are all different, and they unlock different target tissues. And there are many, many more. There's adeno-associated viruses from most animal species. Uh, these are just some of them. The ones with the uh, numbers on them are usually those that are found in humans. And I neglected to mention at the beginning that this is a virus that doesn't cause any human disease. It was actually found as a contaminant when people were studying adenovirus. And so the danger here isn't really causing uh, an infection or an infectious disease. The, the danger is an immune response, or, or as we'll talk later. But human adenoviruses usually are illustrated with just a number. If you see the notation RH under the adenovirus name, like A AVRH10, that's from rhesus macaques, rhesus monkeys. Um, there are other kinds of adenoviruses that have come from other species or, or been isolated and named different things. Uh, and each of those has a different tissue tropism because they're each shaped a little bit differently, so they represent different keys, and uh, they will get into the cells that have the uh, 
the right locks. And so you can see by the check marks which of these adenovirus serotypes tend to be able to infect which types of cells. So, for example, we're obviously interested the most in skeletal muscle, and many of them get into skeletal muscle. And we're also interested in heart muscle, and there's a few of those that get into the heart muscle as well. So, adenovirus 9, adenovirus rhesus number 10, uh, and the muscular dystrophy trials being done here are actually using uh, RH74, so a different serotype to get into heart and skeletal muscle. But you can see if you're a a neurologist and wanting to look at other kinds of tissues, you might choose a different serotype, or if you're trying to get into the lung or the eye, you might use a different serotype. The eye, uh, the FDA approved eye, uh, serotype is using AV2 for that, um, the Luxerna product. Okay, so let's go inside the virus now. On the left, you can see the outside of the shell, but on the right is a diagram, a schematic diagram of the genome of the virus. So on the top here, we see the wild-type genome. It's a very simple genome. It's not very many base pairs. So if you think about the average uh, gene uh, to encode most proteins, uh, it takes at least a 1,000 base pairs to encode most proteins, and the whole genome is only about... Uh, 4.7 thousand base pairs, 4,680 base pairs. And there's, uh, inverted terminal repeats, which are the ITRs on the ends. Those are sequences that are uh, backwards to one another. And then there you see two major gene products, the rep gene and the cap gene. So the cap gene encodes the capsid proteins, which you see illustrated by black on the left, the capsid shell. And the rep gene uh, encodes a number of different gene products, each of these. It looks like there's only two genes, but because there's different promoters within them and splicing, you get a, a number of different proteins. But the rep genes really have to do with how that virus integrates uh, and how it replicates, how it integrates into the genome and how it replicates. So what scientists have done is basically take all of this genome except the inverted terminal repeat and delete it. You need those inverted terminal repeats to package the DNA into the shell. And so those remain, as you can see here, in, in a recombinant adeno-associated virus. And they've replaced the rep and the cap genes with their transgene, which is what they want to express in the cell. And it's driven by the promoter, again, the volume knob of that transgene. And also, not just the volume, but which cells, it determines which cells it might get expressed into. So you can see that you can only replace, this transgene and the promoter can only uh, equal the size of the original virus because the capsid is, has a certain limitation on its size. You can't stuff extra DNA uh, into the capsid. So we're limited on the size of the genes we can put in for these adeno-associated viruses. Now, the promoter uh, choices are based on a lot of different factors. There are strong promoters that are active across a lot of cell types, and there are tissue-specific pr promoters that are selectively expressed. So, again, the volume knobs for the gene expression. A common strong promoter was isolated from a virus called cytomegalovirus. It's a 0.8 kilobase promoter, and it's advantageous because it's uh, very high levels. It's a lot of volume but it's also turned off or silenced in the brain. And so if someone wants to express genes in the brain, that might not be the best choice. Another virus, SV40, there's been promoters that have been used, elongation factor, 1-alpha chicken, beta-act, and all these genes, all these are promoters from normal genes that have been uh, basically hijacked to use in gene therapy. And another common one is chicken or a CAG promoter. It comes from a piece of the CMV promoter, some of the chicken beta actin promoter, and a rabbit beta globin promoter. And it's a very strong promoter as well, but it's quite big, 1.7 kilobases. So that's going to take up a lot of room if one wants to use that. The tissue-specific ones are very attractive because uh, you could potentially only turn the volume up for the gene in the cells that you really want it expressed in. And so a common one is muscle creatinine kinase, which is active in cardiac and skeletal muscle. And uh, there are other tissue-specific promoter genes that people have used depending on the type of cell that they want to restrict the expression. For example, alpha-1 anatrypsin uh, hemophilia community wants to express genes in the liver, and it's not, not a bad one for that purpose. So the choice of promoter is very important. But what about the transgene? Once the promoter is chosen, that only leaves us a certain amount of room depending on which promoter. And clearly, we're not going to be able to put the entire dystrophin gene in an adeno-associated virus. The entire 
a coding region or the cDNA for the dystrophin gene is about 14,000 kilobase pairs. The actual coding part that, that makes the actual protein is, is 3685 amino acids, and each of those needs three base pairs, so that's 11,500 base pairs. So we would need that as a minimum plus our uh, promoter region, and that's just that's more than twice what we can put into an adeno-associated virus. So the choices are to pick another virus that's bigger, which is something one could do, but other viruses have different tissue tropisms and may have different disadvantages and may cause stronger immune responses because they're bigger. And so, well, by and large, the community has tried to make the adeno-associated viruses work because of all the uh, advantages of using the adeno-associated viruses. And so, the solution has been to use genes that are smaller but still have good function uh, in terms of potential for correcting the defect. And so uh, one is the mini dystrophin, which is found in some Becker uh, dystrophy patients in which the rod domains, some of these repeats, are now uh, diminished in their number, so you still have all the other functional aspects of the protein. That protein, the seeding is still a bit large for an associated virus, but uh, with some modifications potentially could be stuffed in there. And then the other is the microdystrophin where it's even shorter, and now we're getting into the ranges of the sizes that we can fit along with a promoter into adeno-associated virus. And so the hope is that these shorter versions can still function significantly enough to correct uh, the, the problem. So the ongoing gene therapy clinical trials for Duchenne muscular dystrophy are on, listed on this table. Uh, I was able to pull down most of this information from the public domain. Uh, the, the first one, which is being conducted here at Nationwide Children's Hospital by Dr. Kevin Flanagan, there was already a, a webinar that PPMD sponsored on this. And I would put this into the category of modifying a cell's behavior as opposed to correcting a defective gene. This is an approach where they found that by putting in this GAL GT2 gene, the cells are not, are, are protected somewhat from, from being destroyed, so the muscle cells are more stable. So this is more of a modification of the cell to make it more resistant to the damage of, uh, that normally is associated with lack of dystrophin. You can see here it's an AAV with a rhesus macaque 74 and a uh, muscle creatinine kinase promoter, so that's what all those letters mean uh, that are driving that transgene. Um, so uh, we call this surrogate. It's not replacing the missing gene, but it's a surrogate for replacing the missing gene. And this study is being uh, tested with perfusion of l both legs uh, into an artery to help increase the um, number of viruses uh, that can reach those muscle cells in the legs. And two different doses are being tested, five times in a 13 vector vector genomes per kilogram and one times 10 to the 14. The next study listed here is uh, being sponsored by Pfizer and conducted at Duke University. And uh, this is using an adenovirus 9, which if you go back to that table, you'll see it does transduce uh, both muscle, skeletal muscle and heart muscle. They're using a human creatine kinase promoter, which will drive it in those muscle cells and, and either turn it off or have it very minimal in other cells. Again, a phase one safety study. Uh, they're testing two different dose levels with six patients at each, ages 5 to 12, uh, using the mini dystrophin, giving it intravenously, and here are the two dose levels that they're using. And these dose levels were based largely on animal studies uh, by ramping up the dose and finding what kind of dose actually gets uh, the gene into much, many of the muscle cells in the animals. I've listed on the last column here the clinicaltrials.gov number if you want to go at any time to www.clinicaltrials.gov and see the public information on these trials for yourself. And then Solid Biosciences is conducting at the University of Florida another adenovirus 9 study. Uh, this again, phase 1. Um, there is a randomization where they're going to have controls who don't get the virus, but then after one year they're able to get the virus. So they can compare patients enrolled on the study at the beginning that do or don't get the virus, ages 4 to 17, using a microdystrophin. And I was unable to find the doses that companies using in this study, but if anyone on the call knows, please send those in to uh, PPMD and we can add that to the table when it's posted. And then finally, this study that um, is being conducted here at Nationwide Children's by Dr. Jerry Mendel uh, using, again, a, a recombinant adeno-associated virus, 
with the Rhesus 74 stereotype, which has known, been shown to be efficiently getting into muscle, cardiac and muscle, skeletal muscle, using the muscle um, creatine kinase uh, uh, promoter, driving um, a microdystrophin gene. And there's going to be six patients enrolled at each of two different age groups, a very young age group uh, first, three months to three years, and then a slightly older group, uh, four to seven years. Again, given intravenously, and, and these, in, in our, I believe, are all one-time dosing, uh, two times 10 to the 14th vector kilograms, uh, vector genomes per kilogram in uh, 10 milliliters per kilogram dosing. So uh, I think it's a very exciting time, but as, as we'll talk about in a bit, this is very early, and these are just the initial forays into human gene therapy trials for muscular dystrophy. The problems can be uh, categorized into uh, potential side effects, immune-based and non-immune-based. So let's turn to those to understand those a little bit better now. So you can get immune reactions to the adeno-associated virus. It's not um, a normal thing for humans to be exposed to viruses in general, although uh, a large pop percentage of the population does have exposure to adeno-associated virus. Something like 40% of adults have antibodies in their bloodstream against it, meaning that they've been exposed to it at some point. Um, and uh, those antibodies are known as the humoral immune system. So uh, those are usually against the virus capsid, and they're circulating in the bloodstream. And if they're preexisting before we give the gene therapy, they could neutralize these viruses and prevent them from working or from getting to the cell. And that's what this uh, line here represents, that the neutralizing humoral antibodies that are against the virus capsid might thwart the whole thing right away. And so patients in these clinical trials are being screened for those antibodies up front and excluded if they have them. Now, that's not to say that that will always need to be the case, um, and we'll talk about some ways people are trying to get around that, but at least for these initial trials, patients are being excluded if they have uh, neutralizing anti-capsid antibodies against adeno-associated virus. So as we mentioned before, adenovirus binds the receptor on the cell, comes into the cell, uh, and goes into the nucleus to express its genes. But another thing that happens is the cell recognizes the, the proteins of the virion as something it doesn't want in there, and it degrades those through the proteasome, which I'm circling here, uh, and you get small peptides that are derived from the proteins of the shell of the virus. And in addition to sort of being thrown in the trash can of the cell, these peptides can be processed and uh, to alert the immune system that the cell is infected. That processing system happens in the Golgi bodies, which is shown here, or the and the endoplasmic reticulum, and it involves the human leukocyte antigen system, the uh, tissue typing. So each person has a slightly different HLA type, and that protein um, binds to those peptides from the virus capsid, and then, as you can see, on the surface of the cell here, the cell expresses um, what we call presents those peptides in the context of this HLA molecule. And that alerts the immune system to say, hey, I'm an infected cell. Uh, you might want to do something about that. And so the cellular immune system, mainly T cells, but also other kinds of lymphocytes like NK cells, um, will attack an infected cell. The T cell will recognize this peptide that's presented and, and uh, attack it as an infected cell. And, and in cancers, for example, some cells that downregulate or don't express these HLA molecules, in which case the NK cells come around and say, hey, you're not playing the game right. We're gonna, um, you're not a, a card-carrying normal cell, so we're going to get rid of you. So that's what these lymphocytes do on the immune system. So this can cause a number of problems with uh, the whole idea of a gene correction for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, basically either preventing the virus from working or destroying the cell in which uh, it was expressing the gene and therefore uh, thwarting our whole uh, attempt at correcting the, the missing or defective gene. 
just a few comments about the pre-existing immunity that can happen. So that can either come in the very young from the mom. So maternal antibodies are detected in newborns, and that's what gives you protection from infections early in life until you can make your own. The humoral immunity starts in the first year or two of life, um, and these neutralizing antibodies uh, can impact the gene transfer. So in animal studies, non-human primates, titers as low as 1 to 5 can block gene transfer. And what does that mean? Just to explain briefly about how we measure antibody titers, it's by a dilution method. So if we have the original undiluted blood here or undiluted serum, then we dilute it 50%. So if you have 2 mils of it here, you might take 1 mil and add it to 1 mil of a diluent and so forth. You take 1 mil of that and add it to another mil and you dilute it down 1 to 2 or 1 to 4 or 1 to 8, 1 to 16, 1 to 32. And at each of those test tubes we test for activity, is that antibody still there? Is it still neutralizing the, the virus by our tests? And how much does it take to lose that activity? So if, if you see somebody with a 1 to 32, they had a pretty high concentration. You had to dilute it all the way down to 1 to 32. Sometimes it might be 1 to 64, 1 to 128, or so forth, if they had a very concentrated antibody. So, again, I mentioned about 1 to 5 uh, is the level at which uh, a um, serum will inactivate adeno-associated virus. So it might be tolerable to have 1 to 2, but much above 1 to 4 or 1 to 8 is too much and uh, will inhibit the gene transfer. And so for these initial trials, at least patients are being excluded uh, because if they have those antibodies, uh, it probably is kind of like shooting ourselves in the foot from the start. Now, the immunity, another aspect of the immune response is the fact that immunity is polyclonal. Immunity is, that means it can uh, recognize different antigens. So what I've drawn here or what I've copied from the web is sort of a, an illustration of a protein that's folded in a lot of different ways in the middle. And antibodies can recognize different aspects of that protein, different antigens. So it's not just one antibody against the whole protein. It's different antibodies against different pieces of it. So what does that mean for Duchenne, so if you took the exons, 79 exons of the DMT gene uh, that encode, uh, you know, the whole protein is shown on the bottom, but if you have a deletion, for example, of part of that, then you might express just the first half of the protein and not the second half. And so the body will notice that the first half is normal, but if you re-express that second half by gene transfer, it might recognize that second half as foreign and make antibodies, as I've drawn here, against that part of the protein that's now being expressed that is considered new to the body. So that's a risk uh, for patients who have deletion mutations that some of the proteins that are newly expressed will be seen as foreign. So other immunologic reactions besides pre-existing immune responses to the virus or responding to the foreign protein is that that whole immune response that's killing cells that are infected can cause organ damage, can cause loss of that transient expression because it's killing the cells that are infected. Uh, it could be related to the capsid load. So um, uh, the product, the purity of the product and what the dose we're giving, the more you give, the more likely the immune response is going to recognize it as foreign. Um, but we don't really know why some patients will have a strong immune response and others won't. It can be related to the tissue type, the HLA type. Not every type will be able to process and present to the immune system all the peptides of, of a virus protein. Uh, it could also be related to whether their immune system is primed to that virus by prior exposure. And also there could be contaminants in the product. They're, it's very difficult to purify these viruses away from the cells that they were grown in. So there can be host cell DNA or host cell lipids or host cell proteins that can contaminate the product and also be immunogenic and, and, and elicit an immune response. Um, but there are prevention strategies, and so most patients in these trials have some sort of immunosuppression. It may be that their steroid doses is uh, cranked up a bit or uh, during the period of time that the virus is being given. Uh, there are also strategies. We can run a patient's plasma through a machine, that um, an apheresis machine, uh, to do plasmapheresis where we can remove proteins of certain size. You can remove antibodies and temporarily uh, get rid of those preexisting 
antibodies uh, and then perhaps come in and give the, vir- the virus and make it possible to get that virus to the muscle cells. Uh, but that's only temporary. The immune system will continue to make antibodies that would fill up the immune system. So there might be ways around some of these uh, problems, but the best ways around still have yet to be explored. Now, are there risks of non-immunologic side effects? Certainly, there was a, a report recently about uh, some animals, uh, non-human primates, young ones and piglets, given an adeno-associated nine that was expressing the spinal muscular atrophy gene, SMN1, uh, at 2 times 10 to the 14th vector copies, uh, vector genomes per kilogram. The Primates had liver toxicity. The piglets did not, but they had neurotoxicity. And uh, that raises some questions about the safety of this uh, whole approach. There were a couple of commentaries that were published regarding these studies. Uh, some of the things they said is, well, these are small numbers, so we're not certain. There was no dose escalation. We don't know if there's a dose that's safe, and this was just an unsafe dose. There could have been contaminants. We had not a lot of different ways to prepare the product were tested. The capsid and transgenes are not the same as being used in human trials, so we don't know if those, the, uh, the toxicity was due to those. The human gene they use is not native to those species, and so it's possible that there was a problem there. So they basically suggested let's not ignore these findings, but let's not overreact, and so far uh, the studies in people um, are have been safe, and but we do need additional studies and full transparency. But as long as we follow the good clinical practice guidelines for research, uh, which mandates you know very slow, one step at a time, uh, and so forth, uh, and, and careful study and following the patients, that we should be able to figure this out. So what Pat Furlong really has wanted to know is when might we see benefit, and of course this is an unknown. But uh, there's no reason it couldn't be right away. I mean, the the gene transfer happens very quickly. Genes that get into nuclei of the cell happens within hours. They can get turned on right away, start making the the normal protein, and then how long does it take for that normal protein to really fill up the cell and and be functioning in a normal way? We don't know, but uh, there's no reason to think it's going to take months or years if it's working. It could be right away. But I'd like to close my formal comments with just some of the remaining questions uh, to uh, basically convey the idea that we're just at the beginning. There's still a lot to learn. Uh, it's an exciting time, but there's still a lot of research to be done. And those the, the unknowns really fall into the categories of, you know, how can we make it better? Or how can we make it work, uh, the benefit, and then what are the risks? So in terms of the benefit or the effectiveness, you know, is this shorter uh, micro or mini dystrophin sufficient to restore good enough function, or are we going to have to go to longer versions and or other uh, strategies? Can we get it into enough cells? or into enough muscles or into enough muscle fibers to really, uh, you know, affect ability to walk, improve ability to walk. Um, is it going to get into the skeletal and the heart? And uh, so I meant to actually write tongue here, not muscle, but um, or vascular muscle cells. You know, is it going to be able to correct everything uh, that we needed to correct? And what's the optimal dosing to achieve high enough levels? And how long is the expression going to last? And will we need to redose? And is redosing even possible? Uh, because of the immunity, maybe we can redose with different serotypes, one after the other. Um, is there an optimal age uh, or or maybe an optimal disease stage with, in terms of how much fibrosis is present? And can this be used for all patients regardless of mutation? Uh, and can we circumvent pre-existing humoral immunity to make it work, like using plasmapheresis, as I mentioned? And then on the side effects side, of course, you know, what are the best ways to manage or mitigate that immune response? And what are the best ways to manage the non-immune side effects? And what are those going to be that we run into? The studies in animals may give us a hint, but as you saw with two different species, they were different types of side effects. So we don't really know the answers to these questions, but that's why we need to do these research studies. So that's the end of my formal uh, comments. I'm happy to have a discussion with the remaining time. Thank you, Tim. Uh, we really appreciate that. Abby Bronson and I are here to um, just begin to ask some more detailed questions about, obviously, um, when is this, when will we see an effect is, is up for grabs because we, at this moment, uh, two children have, have um, received gene transfer at Nationwide Children's, another is scheduled, and it's early days for us to understand what 
uh, what we are going to see and when. So we're going to have just a few questions. One of the questions that has come in is about um, if a child has revertant fibers or is expressing dystrophin to a very low level, do you suppose that this microdisc would compete with that or be complementary to that, or would this child basically be able to receive a gene therapy? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And <coughs> excuse me. Um, what will happen with normal genes versus the trans gene, and a lot of that will depend on how the um, the volume is turned up with the promoter and the relative expression of the normal versus the new one. Uh, and then uh, I, the biology of that, I think, is also a little bit unknown in terms of will these proteins interact with each other and, and how will it, what will that interaction look like. Certainly we know in, in generally that uh, proteins can be complementary to each other or they can be inhibitory to each other so you can get what's called dominant negative. If one defective protein interacts with another normal protein, it can actually prevent it from, from working. So I think a lot of it's going to depend on what the specific uh, structure, uh, the mutations are, and also the relative levels. So that's a, a big unknown. Right, thank you. And one of the other questions is around the type of mutation. Um, uh, this this gene therapy could be applied to all mutations. I think you m might talk about, uh, at least in Jerry Mendel's study, he's really being cautious about looking at boys with a mutation, whether that's a deletion, duplication, or otherwise a small change, um, within 18, exons 18 to 58. And that's because of those hinge re regions that he doesn't want to get in the way of. Can you shed a little little more light on that? Well, I think uh, there is, uh, uh, again, this is a stepwise approach, and um, what he's designed now is to what he feels is, is the safest and the most likely to work, uh, and that's not to say that other mutations or duplications or other um, uh, deletions won't won't, it won't be useful for because it may very well be uh, what he wants to do is limited to those he thinks are not going to cause a problem. For example, if he used patients with large deletions, they might have a big immune response to the new gene, so he wants to minimize that. So I think he's just designed it to as a first step, uh, but that's not shutting out the others for the future. Right, and so individuals with duplications in the same window would be acceptable for the study as well. Is that right? Right. I think those are advantageous in the sense that the antigens are probably all there. They're just not working as well, so the immune response is likely to be less. Great. Thank you. So one question has come in. My son, who's 18 months old, was tested positive for the antibodies that would attack the AAV virus, and therefore he's disqualified from Mendel trial. I'm wondering if those antibodies disqualify him from all gene therapy studies um, using the AAV, and is there anything being done to work around those antibodies to make gene therapy an option? Well, those antibodies are usually serotype specific, meaning if, uh, that they may not cross-react or may not uh, attack all different kinds of those viruses. So AAV2 versus AAV9 versus AAV RH74, when, those are defined by what antibodies bind them. So they're distinct serotypes. So it wouldn't necessarily disqualify them for other uh, if, if a different trial is using a different serotype, uh, it, it likely wouldn't disqualify him. That said, he could also have antibodies to those other serotypes, depending on what he's been previously exposed to. I think one of the ideal scenarios in the distant future would be to have off-the-shelf um, uh, different serotypes ready to go and pick the one that the patient hasn't seen already that still gets into the right cells. That makes sense. Annie? So I have a question. You talked about the immunologic responses to AAV and the dystrophin that's newly produced. Um, but could you talk a little bit about, you know, you can have those immune responses that are uh, safety-related and efficacy-related. And so, you know, big toxic reactions or maybe reactions that we don't really see but might impact efficacy. Is that, am I correct in understanding that? And could you talk a little bit about that? Well, there are certainly um, various stages of the immune response, and, and one could potentially have an allergic reaction to some of these products that are being infused just right away, and so that would be like an anaphylactic reaction where the body is, is directly reacting to the infusion of these foreign proteins or 
and or possibly uh, rare contaminants that might be in the product. Uh, so that's a bit different, but um, and that does happen in medicine not infrequently, and we'll have to be careful about that in some patients who may just react to that. But the actual immune response uh, is something that uh, can be uh, uh Again, humoral versus cellular are two big categories, but it could be also uh, something that comes on later in life uh, or later after the gene transfer if the right conditions are present. So uh, it might work for a while, and then the immune response sort of gathers steam and um, and might cause damage to the infected the cells that are expressing the, the foreign protein. And also another thing to consider is the reaction to the, the virus itself is only going to be near the beginning um, because once the gene's in, uh, the virus shell is no longer around, and it's not going to be making new shells. It's not an active infection. And so the immune response that's due to immune response to the damage that's due to an immune response against the virus outer shell may be something that could be managed for a while and then uh, would, would go away on its own because there's no longer any virus shells around. But the immune response then to the transgene might still be an issue in terms of uh, efficacy. Okay. And so how, I guess, follow-up questions, how, is there a way to monitor for those reactions? And is there a point at which you can say, one could say, oh, we're out of the woods? Oh, it's probably early days. <laughs> Yeah, I think that there's going to have to be a lot of work in that area because what we need, the, the key word or the buzzword we would use is a biomarker. Is there a biomarker that sort of reflects um, what's happening at the cellular level that we could detect in the blood perhaps? And there may be, uh, it may be that people uh, are able to figure out some biomarkers, some uh, proteins that they can detect in the blood or cells that they can detect in the blood, maybe the T cells that are against the virus or T cells that are against muscle fibers um, or uh, muscle uh, enzymes that are released by by damage like, uh, uh, you know, LDH or other things, and, and, and it may be that those become biomarkers but uh, of whether, whether there's damage going on. Uh, in terms of biomarker for efficacy, that's a little bit harder. As you know right now, the main way is to do a muscle biopsy to look for expression of the transgene, but there may be other ways to do that in the future, and um, uh, it, it, it may just be uh, a reduction in the enzymes that are being released from the damaged muscles as they're less damaged. So I think that's still uh, unknown territory. So, Tim, a question about the adeno-associated virus. Um, you know, the thought if you have a if you if you have Duchenne or if you ha are a young man if you have a child with Duchenne, um, then the idea sort of comes to mind that you put that child in a bubble so that you risk or, or at least decreases risk of exposure to the AAV. So, is there anything people can do or should be doing to decrease that risk? Wow, that's a great question. But you know. Uh, again, this AAV was found as a contaminant. It's floating around. We don't even know where it comes from. Uh, people do get exposed to it, and obviously a fair number of people, 40%. Um, uh, but how they get exposed, I'm not certain. So I don't think there's anything we can do at this point to uh, avoid it. Thank you. And uh, I think for all of you online, we are, we are, we have launched our gene therapy benefit risk study. I'd ask all of you to join that benefit risk study and really take time to answer this. This is really important for the FDA, who's going to be looking at these studies and, and certainly um, making decisions about their approval. So, so please, please do the benefit risk study that, that is now online and available. We, we're, we're really begging in this case because we think it's so critically important to the regulatory um, uh, process for the gene therapies. So there's another question, Tim. Do the different structures of the microdist transgene and the protein they produce in the AAV trials predict the T cell response to the microdist protein being produced? Uh, well, I think the microdystrophin still has all the various domains. It's mainly the repeat region that's been deleted to allow it to be shortened. So the complement of antigens that are present and being expressed are all still there. Uh, it's not like the more immunogenic regions of the protein have been deleted. So uh, I 
don't think that 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 we can predict that there'll be less of a problem or, or less of a T cell. Again, I mentioned some of the variables. There's certainly many others, but you know, HLA type, how robust the expression is, whether someone is, you know, highly sensitive to, to immune responses or not. I mean, there's a lot of different variables uh, that determine that, and I don't think it's going to be as something as simple as as the um, gene to gene expression. Now, some in some fields with gene therapy, we've been able to change the amino acid sequence. That we've been able to identify that on certain proteins, there's some amino acids that are more immunogenic, and we can change those to less immunogenic amino acids and retain the function of the protein. So it may be that we could do that in the future if we find certain regions or hot spots for an immune reaction and we're able to change those, reduce that without changing the function. But, again, that's all research that's yet to be done. Right. And so I think we can expect from individual to individual we may see a variable response, and that's probably what your experience has been in, in the oncology Oh, yes, for sure, yes. The biology is complicated. Everybody's different. Yes, that's true. Um, and someone asked where th to find the um, benefit risk survey. It's on Duchenne Connect. Um, so you can access our website and, and uh, uh, the Duchenne Connect website and see the, and see the um, benefit risk. So the last question as we come up to time, and this has been really, really amazing. Uh, Tim, thank you so much. How can I know if my son was ever exposed to the AAV virus? So is there a, is there a screening that patients and families could do on their own with their primary care provider, or where could they learn this and as quickly as possible? I actually don't know the answer to that. I know they're, they're doing it as part of these studies as they're screening, but I think those are specialized labs. I don't know if that's publicly available, but I'm sure that you will be able to find out and somehow post it on your website. Yeah, I, I think that this is only done in the specialty labs and, they, and certainly those, those sites that are involved in the clinical trials. So I just wanted uh, individuals to know that it's, it's not a routine lab test that you can go to your primary care doc and, and ask for uh, the drawing of, of titers. So this would be, have, to done, have to be done through your um, specialty clinic. And with that, we've reached the 2 o'clock mark. Tim, thank you. This has been incredibly uh, helpful to all of us. Should any of you online have questions, please send them in to us, and we will um, make sure that they're answered uh, so that you completely get most of your questions, if not all of them, answered in as quickly as possible. We know this, these are early days and exciting times, and we're looking forward to seeing what happens and hopefully many more children being uh, treated with uh, gene therapy. Thank you again, Tim, and thank you all for joining us on this webinar. It will be archived and posted. The Benefit Risk Survey is on Duchenne Connect. And, and please um, make sure that you address that uh, preference study so that we have the data for the FDA. Thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you soon. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Tim. Bye-bye.